Hey, what's up, YouTube? I've been quite busy this week, but I managed to work on some stuff here and there. That bubble material, for instance, got a bit of interest on Twitter, so I thought I'd do a quick breakdown. Now, what are we looking at here? I have a blueprint composed of an instant static mesh component. The mesh is a simple eight vertices plane. It could very well be a square to reduce vertex count, but we are going to draw a sphere on this mesh using a translucent material, and so we'd have quite a bit more transparent pixels if we were to use a square, and generally overdraw is more costly than vertex count. I mean, it depends obviously, but here we should benefit from using a mesh that is at least somewhat spherical. Make sure your Vs are good, because we'll need them. The blueprint has a simple construction script that spawns a number of instances in random location, and that's it. No tick, no nothing. The rest is entirely driven by a single material. That material is translucent and unlit to be as cheap as possible. It's 146 pixel instructions and 231 vertex instructions for texture samples, so it's not that bad. You could turn off fog to make it drastically cheaper, but be cautious with that, right? It might start to look weird in case the mesh should indeed be fogged. If you have just a tiny bit of distant fog in your scene, and maybe use LODs or something to make sure these bubbles aren't seen from a distance, it could be an option. Anyway, let's dive in. The material is built around functions that are passing material attributes. I love that workflow. It allows you to nicely organize your material and work on it one step at a time. I start by making a blank material attribute with zero values. Then I compute my wall position offsets. It takes a scalar parameter as an input to control the scale of the bubbles. So in here, I'm just adding to the wall position offset, which is null at this point, but whatever. Let's see what's inside that function. The getTime function here returns multiple values. First is the time randomly offset per instance. Then here I have my time loop. It goes from zero to the duration of my loop. Here it's 10, then loops back to zero and so on. Divide by that same duration so I can return a zero to one normalized time value. So that value here goes from zero to one linearly and jump back to zero every 10 seconds. And then I remap that zero to one gradient so that one is like in the middle so it goes from 0 to 1 to 0 linearly. And that's my time function. I use that ever-increasing time value here with sine and cosine to create an oscillating x and y value that creates a sort of vortex motion. And I also add a constant z offset so my bubble is constantly moving upward. All that is multiplied by my time loop. If I kill my fade in fade out thing you'll see the bubbles jumping from their end position to their start position. This multiply makes the offset loop, right? By scaling that whole x, y, z offset vector from 0 to 1 and back to 0. Now, obviously, we don't want to see the bubbles jump like that. So the fade in and fade out is precisely timed so that the jump happens when the bubble is not visible. And that's done here. That whole thing is multiplied by that bilinear gradient that goes from 0 to 1 to 0 linearly. Now that's the math used to align the plane to the camera. Remember the bubble is a flat plane, right? But it's kept facing the camera just like particles in Niagara or Cascade. Here's the test material with a simplified version of that node setup. And here's my test scene. My world origin is over there, my object is over there, and I made four instances. Now we are going to take a right vector and convert it from view space to world space. Let's say this is my camera, that's going to give me a one unit vector starting at 0, 0, 0 and pointing in the same direction than that red arrow. I then use my UVs and take the axis corresponding to my mesh's x-axis. In my case, I had to use the Y channel due to how my mesh was unwrapped, whatever, and that will offset all vertices in that direction by that amount. Let's see that in action, right. See, it starts to get all crooked and that seems to follow the view. We subtract our UVs by 0.5, however, so that all vertices to the left of that center line are shifted in that direction and the rest in the opposite direction. And we do the same thing for the y-axis. 
Now that gives us an offset, but we actually want to replace each vertex initial position with that offset. So we subtract the world position. Essentially that will collapse all vertices to the origin and then add our offset. Now we have our mesh aligned to the camera. But then they all are stacked on top of each other. So we add back our object position, so each vertex will offset based on their own instance initial position. And voila, it's good to know that the object position node is essentially a null vector converted from local space to world space, and that when working with instance static meshes, it corresponds to each instance pivot point. And that's it, we multiply the mesh size by our object scale, so it's scale independent, and we have our world position offset. That's all a bit tricky, but hopefully that makes sense. Anyway, cool, all right, we have our world position offset. Now all my emissive functions pretty much uses what's computed down below, so let's take a look at that first. By the way, these nodes are named reroute. It's a new thing in 4.27. It's amazing, it keeps the material graph clean, so use them. I have a get UVs function here. All it does is return the texture coordinates, shifted by some noise, sampled at a per instance randomized world position. Be cautious of that node, it can get expensive. Here I'm using a fast gradient, no turbulence and one level, that costs 16 instructions and one texture lookup, so it's fine. With those distorted UVs, I sample a spherical normal map. That's one I baked myself in Blender, I made a sphere and rendered the world normals. Make sure to use a file format when saving the render, that can encode negative values for negative x and y axis. Now we are going to convert that sample normal from view space to world space, just like we did to generate our camera aligned vertex coordinates for our world position. Make sure that the normals you get from that normal map converted from view space to world space matches Unreal Engine's coordinate system by checking the world normal buffer and comparing the result to an actual sphere mesh. If not, flip channels around until you get the desired result. We do the same thing here, but with flipped X and Y components, so it's essentially the normals of the inside of the sphere. And we return the Z value as well, to use as a mask in a couple of our functions. Alright, now that we have our spherical normals in world space, and our mesh aligned to the camera, we can start to work on the emissive. First, there's a rim light. We can just get the Z component of that normal map to get the edges of our bubble, right? I added a bunch of parameters to control the fall off color and strength. That rim light is added both to the opacity and emissive, right? You might have no rim light per se, but you might still want to show a dark edge, like it's usually the case with bubbles. They tend to have a dark outlines, so that needs to be added to the opacity. Moving on to the reflection, I use that world sphere normal to compute a reflection vector used to project a texture with some random colors. All this, by the way, is very artistic, right? It's definitely not physically correct. It's just made to look cool and give you some artistic control. Moving on to some fake lighting. Those two nodes, atmospheric light vector and color, will return you both the direction and color of the directional light in your scene if one is indeed flagged to be the atmospheric sunlight. And that's how my material can react to the sun direction and color. So yeah, dot product between that light vector and my sphere were normal to add some light. Then I kinda wanted to further control that fake light, because I didn't like how it looked when viewing the bubble from the light's point of view. So I used another dot product between the camera direction vector and light vector, so that this fake light is mostly visible when not looking straight away or towards the light. Again, that's absolutely not physically based, it's purely artistic and was made to emphasize the specular light that we'll add in a minute. Light through that's basically the same thing, dot product between the light vector and my world sphere normal, but this time with the inverted world normal. So it's like we add some light on the other side of the bubble. Specular, same exact thing once again dot product between the light vector and my world sphere normal, but with a crazy high exponent. And then I use the Z component of my spherical normal map as an overall opacity mask. 
and that's pretty much it looks pretty cool in my opinion and it's quite cheap you could obviously build such effects quite a bit more easily with Niagara or Cascade but I would argue this is less expensive and it's also nice every now and then to work with vectors and do some math to do cool tricks on your own files are available as a tier 1 reward on my Patreon if you want to support me I would be very grateful speaking of Patreon I also added those little guys those birds are animated purely using math and sine waves and are as cheap as can be files are available as a tier 1 reward as well shout out to my latest patron supporters let me butcher your names Liam O'Leary, Brendan Lobe and Steve Sperrin thank you guys you can also follow me on twitter I've been very active on it lately sharing all kind of doodles and work in progress I will have news soon regarding my own video game as well so definitely stay tuned for that leave a like if you like the content and consider subscribing Thanks a lot, have a good day, see ya!